<laughs> hey guys, yeah, I'm I'm talking about physical hardware today. Um, so, yeah, so uh, my day job, I do completely different things, but I'm going to talk about a little kind of side business that I have, and that's kind of designing and uh, selling synthesizers. And I thought my latest project uh, might be, yeah, interesting to you guys. So thank you for inviting me here. I guess. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Teliqua, which is an open hardware FPGA-based synthesizer, but just to start out, uh, I kind of I wanted to get an idea. Who here knows what Eurorack is? Eurorack. Eurorack. Okay, so like okay, about half the room. So uh, just to give you an idea, Eurorack is a extremely popular format for combining hardware synthesizer modules into a instrument to create all sorts of different kinds of electronic music. So it's often used for sound design. Uh, you'll often see setups like this. Um, at festivals used for live performance. Um, but one thing that you won't commonly see is even if people are using, you know, like a, a, a digital, for example, Ableton-based setup for their performance, they'll often do sound design on a hardware synthesizer system like this to create some weird sounds and then integrate that with samples and so on into their, into their music. Um, so I just wanted to give you an idea of what Eurorack is. It's definitely the most popular hardware synthesizer format. Um, it's huge if you go to Superbooth, which is in Berlin. It's the biggest synthesizer trade show in the world, like half the vendors are making modules for the Eurac format. So just to give you an idea of how big uh, this, this scene is, um, yeah, I wanted to show you. But uh, before I talk about uh, the synthesizer itself, I wanted to mention some uh, other open hardware projects that kind of inspired this project because I'm using infrastructure from, um, from these projects and probably a lot of people here contributed to a lot of the infrastructure that is uh, being reused in the Telequa project. So for example, Glasgow, um, is an open hardware uh, multi-tool that uh, heavily uses the Amaranth uh, HDL language and the lead maintainer of Amaranth is also kind of a lead maintainer of the Glasgow gateway. Um, so a lot of that stuff's being reused in the Telequa project. Uh, the Syntheon is a USB multi-tool that you can use for doing all sorts of crazy USB things. And a big part of infrastructure inside the Syntheon project is the Luna USB uh, framework that lets you do a lot of really low latency USB stuff purely in in Gateware and also the Luna SOC project, which is an Amaranth framework for building uh, SOCs that is built on Amaranth SOC. I'll go into a little bit more <laughs> details on that specifically later. That might be a bit specific. Um, a spiritual inspiration of this project is Ornament and Crime. That's a different Eurorack module. Uh, and the idea with Ornament and Crime is it's another open hardware Eurorack module based on the Teensy project. And it became very popular because people started creating their own designs and sharing them in the community, different kinds of synthesis modes, different kinds of uh, sequences and so on. Uh, so this project is a little bit in the spirit of that. And Eurorack PMOD uh, is a project that I presented last year at FOSDEM. It's uh, basically a really easy to use uh, audio interface for any FPGA development board with a whole bunch of Verilog examples that lets you get started with FPGA development. But one big problem I had with this project, I sold quite a few of these Eurorack PMODs, um, but there was some people making really cool things like neural network wave shapers and things on the FPGA boards with the Eurorack PMOD and um, this, it, it was really impressive what people were doing, but there was no real way for them to share their designs because everyone was using a different FPGA development board just with this audio interface. Uh, and, and so uh, this project, Teliqua, is my um, quest to, to try and change it. So Teliqua is a Eurac module that instead of just being an audio interface, it actually contains the FPGA. Uh, it is a whole bunch of examples. It contains SOC examples. It contains a whole library of DSP components. Um, and you can do some crazy things like load multiple bit streams onto it and then switch between them while you're performing. So you can load, you know, all sorts of like different hardware configurations onto the synthesizer at the same time and switch between them. Um, but one of the kind of really important goals to me that was probably the most difficult one is I wanted this project to be useful to musicians and not just engineers. So, and, and, and that without touching the HDL. Uh, and so that means making things look really pretty, making the instruments kind of intuitive to use. Uh, that's not my usual domain, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a fun, fun problem, yeah. Um, so this is Teliqua. This is the Teliqua module. It's what it looks like. Uh, you essentially have four uh, audio input lines, four audio output channels. Uh, each one of them is DC coupled, so you can use them for control signals as well as audio signals. Uh, each of them has an indicator LED, and if you don't connect a jack to one of these jacks, the jack is actually touch sensitive, so you can use the jacks as touch inputs as well, so you can get like a haptic 
you have like a haptic, well not haptic, but because it's not feedback, but um, yeah, you can touch the jacks and use that as an input mechanism. Uh, you have on the right here, you have a display output, you have high speed USB 2 audio, so completely in gate where you can do like sub millisecond USB audio. So even if you implement a DSP pipeline to do audio stuff with, uh, like you could use the same DSP pipeline purely on a USB audio stream as well as uh, the analog audio stream. So you can do some, some interesting, interesting things with that. Has MIDI, has two P mods. I feel like anything that has to do with FPGAs needs to have some P mods. So you can use, uh, you can use like commodity P mod uh, boards as well. If you want to add like, I don't know, like an LED panel or an SD card reader or something like this, you can easily just put this in there and, and, and use that as well. So a little bit of a picture behind the hardware. It's made out of three boards, the audio interface board, the motherboard, and uh, system on module. All three of these uh, took a long time to design. Um, the audio board on the left is, is uh, at the center of it is uh, a audio codec for, for input channels, for output channels, I2S interface that talks uh, to the motherboard and the FPGA system on module. Kind of the goal of having this in separate boards is that to Liquid itself, it's designed to be modular. So not only is it a module, but you can take it apart and use bits of it in different ways. So for example, the audio interface board at the top is actually a PMOD connection. So if you have a different FPGA development board, you could take just the audio interface and connect it to the audio section and still use it as just an audio section. Likewise, on the right, the FPGA uh, system on module, which is this, um, you can, in theory, either replace it if you want a different FPGA or memory. Uh, and really the idea is that if you're designing your own instrument and you want to use this kind of FPGA-based technology, you can uh, very easily integrate it into your own instrument design, you know, change where the jacks are, change where the knobs are, change the user interface, uh, change the design, and then reuse this board in your design because doing the high-speed routing is kind of a pain in the ass and a lot of people doing instrument design don't want to have to worry about, you know, memory routing, stuff like this. Um, so on the system on module, which I call the soldier crab, is the configuration flash, FPGA, uh, memory, and the USB 2 fire. So you get all those things on the one module and it's 22 by 22 millimeters, so it's quite, it's quite small. Um, and uh, with, the, with the memory here, I get about 300 megabytes per second, which is enough to do like a 1080p frame buffer, this kind of performance, like that uses less than a third of the bandwidth. So, you know, it's not DDR3 or DDR4, but uh, you can still do quite a lot, especially with uh, audio and video, video synthesis. So um, I want to describe a, a bit quickly like uh, some of the software components that I've been working on. So uh, the Taliqua DSP library has a whole bunch of these components written in Amaranth HDL. Uh, these look like maybe DSP components that you would see in, uh, in you know, I don't know, other fixed point DSP libraries in perhaps, uh, in perhaps Verilog or other languages, but these really have a focus on, on audio. So, I mean, you, you won't find pitch shifters, I think usually in you know, conventional DSP library um, you won't find wave shapers, you won't find uh, ramp generators and stuff like this. Um, so this is kind of DSP components, but the focus is really on, on, on audio stuff. Uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, I heavily use a feature of Amaranth, which is streams, which has landed in the past few months. And I wanted to give you an example of what this looks like because, I mean, uh, so I wanted to make something that uh, not only can musicians use without touching the HDL, but if you want to touch it, that, that it is actually easy to understand what's going on uh, without having to look very deeply into yeah, how the synthesis and stuff works under the hood. So if we take this example here, if I want to build one voice and I want to connect an oscillator to a wave shaper to a delay effect, if I want to do this in, in Amaranth, that looks something like this. You know, I create a component that takes a stream in, emits a stream out. These are all fixed point samples that are flowing in and out. I instantiate my oscillator, my wave shaper, my delay effect, and then I connect them together with Amaranth's wiring, wiring connect interface. And this is how you can connect these DSP components together in kind of an easy to, I feel like a relatively easy to understand way. Um, and uh, yeah, to give you a couple more advanced examples. Uh, so this is something like a reverb. So it takes a dry signal and makes it stereo and it sounds like, you're, I don't know, you're in a church or something like this. This is like a reverb, a simple version of a reverb. But put simply, it's really you take the input signal, you split it into four, put it through a big matrix mixer and then some delay lines of different lengths, mix them back together. Some of the, some of the uh, delay lines are fed back on themselves inside the matrix mixer and some of it is 
ending up at the output and merge back together. And uh, if you take this and you duplicate it many times, that's how you create something very similar to a reverb effect. So that's just yeah, another example of this kind of thing. Um, and then I want to give you a picture of one of the demos I'm about to show. So this is a, this is a polysynth built with all these different DSP components that I was mentioning. Um, so we have kind of a MIDI stream or a, or a touch sensing stream coming in to uh, a voice tracker, which is splitting each, uh, each note into a separate stream that runs at audio rate. And there you can connect you know, the, the oscillator itself to a filter, to a matrix mixer. And that way you can get eight separate voices uh, and then add, for example, your diffusion slash reverb effect and then a wave shaping effect for distortion. And then eventually you get an audio output. So um, to give you an idea, uh, this, this polyphonic synthesizer sitting inside the FPGA uh, with an SOC that's got a Vexris 5 in it and a bunch of peripherals as well as, you know, an arbiter for the RAM as well as like video processing and CRT simulation and all this kind of stuff at once. Uh, it uses up about 50% of the fabric of the FPGA. So this, this design with all this other stuff, it uses, it uses about half the FPGA uh, that I mentioned there. But the kind of the idea with this, with this project and my hope is that uh, users who are just getting started with this world, hopefully they don't have to touch the SOC section of the design and that they play more with just the DSP core because that's a little bit easier to modify. Um, but the purpose of this SOC and all the other things you see here are essentially so that you see kind of a menu system, you see like an oscilloscope display of what's going on, uh, this, kind of, this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so I was gonna try and give you a couple of demos of these examples. Um, so what you're seeing now is uh, just the video stream. Normally this goes to a screen that you can see here, but I've just connected it up so you can see it up here. And this is the bootloader. So here I can pick which, which bitstream I want to run. So if I pick, for example, the polysynth bitstream, then it reboots, reconfigures, the FPGA reconfigures itself. And now we're in the polysynth. So if I, if I uh, touch this, I should get audio, there we go. So you may not be able to hear it very well, but. And these kind of interesting shapes you can see. So if I only touch one note, you can see that you get this interesting kind of uh, oscillographic effect. And that's because of this diffusion delay that I was showing before. So this reverb effect is really taking what is a mono signal and adding some stereo chaos to it so that you end up with an interesting shape. And then I can, for example, from the menu system, I can add distortion, more reverb. You know, I can change the properties of the signal. So at the moment, what you're hearing is just a minor scale across the touch interface, but you can also just have a MIDI connector keyboard and you can play it so like you're this. Just touching the audio jacks. I'm just touching the audio jacks, yeah. So, and the audio jacks, they, they have gradual sensitivity, which is quite cool. So I can touch a little bit. You know. So it's got gradual sensitivity. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's one example. Um, so. Uh, then if I hold down the encoder here, it should reboot itself. Yeah, so now I can pick a different bit stream. So uh, yeah, so one of the things that I've been enjoying experimenting with is uh, is this uh, CRT simulation. So so here I'm taking an oscillator and just visualizing it kind of on a vector scope. You can see that fine up there, yeah. And, uh, you know, during live performance, it's quite uh, a common, it, you might not think it's a common thing, but it's a common thing for people to do to take uh, an oscilloscope and uh, just connect a, uh, well, just have a video camera set up in front of it uh, to basically broadcast the, the, an audio signal as like something that's displayed and to put that through a bunch of video processing to create some interesting graphics while the music is playing. So I could imagine this also potentially being used for that kind of application. Um, and you can do some things like change the color scheme, you know, uh, see what's going on. But again, this is just, this is just visualizing that, uh, that signal there. So that's, uh, yeah, that's some oscillographics. Um, 
As you probably saw, you can also use this just as an oscilloscope. Here's a Commodore 64 simulation. <laughs> so this is taking the, this is just a simulation of the SID from a Commodore 64, so I can, uh, you know, some like very chip y sounding things. Usually what you would do in a, in a modular system is you would, is you would, is you would, um, uh, connect like sequences and so on up to the different parameters of this so that you can tweak them in real time based on what you want the music to do. Uh, I don't know why I can't. I'm not sure why that's not working. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, so there's a few examples here. It's quite crazy because, you know, in real time as you perform, you can switch between completely different hardware, you know, like this is really, uh, and I mean, the device can also be a USB sound card. Uh, it can be an oscillator, it can be different effects. Uh, this is the factory self-test function, so I don't know, maybe you want to see that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, that's uh, all I will show, because I think I'm not, I, I'm a little bit short on time probably today. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if this was interesting to you, uh, I will be so, uh, I'll be launching this on Crowd Supply in a month. So, if you're curious to to get this hardware, I have already bought enough parts for the first 100. Um, I don't know if I'll actually sell that many, but hopefully yes. Uh, so yeah, keep an eye on it, and thanks for thanks for listening and letting me be here. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. So we have like a hundred people in the room, so it's just let's sell you out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? There is one. Right here, um, I, I have to say the fact that this I, you know, proves my point of art being part of engineering as well. So thank you. It's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. What I would like to know, though, is am I old enough to understand what a dirty JTAG is? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so, do, do you want to know what dirty JTAG is? Or? I am 55, so I might have to be tendered. Okay, so, I mean, a dirty J JTAG is a, is a project, um, uh, an open source project that, uh, that implements the JTAG protocol. Yeah. And it, uh, you can find it for a bunch of different microcontrollers. In this case, I'm running it on the RP2040. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that you get a USB JTAG bridge. Uh, on the Telequa, you get on, so you have two USB ports. The top is a debug port, so through there, that's the dirty JTAG. Yep. Uh, and through there you can flash the FPGA, but more importantly, you can also debug the SOC. So uh, it's kind of useful, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. thank you so much, thank you. Further questions? There's one up there. So is the whole process fast enough to do like algorave stuff and like, you know, change a bit of the code, flash it, or is it yeah, is the so delay too high? A, that's, a, that's a very good question because, um, so at the moment, as you saw, when I was switching between the bit streams, it takes maybe 100 milliseconds to do the reconfiguration and that reloads the entire bit stream. Um, but if you wanted to go faster than 100 milliseconds, then you would have to do partial reconfiguration, which is supported by the ECP5, but it's not so easy to do with the tooling like this kind of partial reconfiguration. Um, but in theory, there is nothing stopping you from uh, hot loading in the background a new bit stream while, uh, for example, you do the synth the, there's music playing, the synthesis is happening, after the synthesis, the synthesis is complete, then you upload a new bit stream in the background and then switch to it. But you would always have this like one or 200 milliseconds delay when the hardware is reconfiguring itself from, mm -hmm. the, from the flash. So the ones there, I'm just lazy, I'm not going to repeat the questions, but walk instead. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this looks super cool. Uh, I don't have any, any Euro record or anything. Can I use this just standalone? Um, so I, I think my question would be, if you want to use it standalone, what would you connect it to? That's uh, my question too. I want to play with this, but I don't have anything to connect it to. And so, so th I think a simple answer is uh, you can get, so all of these jacks are mono jacks, that's kind of the Eurorack format, but if you wanted to connect it straight to headphones, for example, you can get these like very simple dual mono to stereo adapters that are a couple of euros. And in that way you could listen to it at least. Um, but then the, 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 the other difference is you can see on the back there's these connectors. 
Normally, only one of them is connected. That's just the power connector on the bottom left. And that needs plus minus 12 volt power. So you can get for like 10 euros just, just a like USB to plus minus 12 volt adapter that's for Eurorack. So you can use this without a Eurorack system. I mean, yeah, so you don't need a Eurorack system. Uh, but I think one of the most fun thing to do with a module like this is to take like a very simple design and see how it interacts with all sorts of different other oscillators and effects and stuff like this. So, Makes yeah. sense. I mean, you can still play with it, but you won't get the full yeah. experience. It's yeah. a good excuse to get into your exactly. exactly. It's, it's exactly. teasing you into buying more hardware. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Have you told Brian Eno about this? <laughs> no. I have not. Do you know who Brian Eno is? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Go look him up. He's, uh, he creates music, which I think this would be perfect. Ah, OK. My wife would hate it. <laughs> um, Seriously, go talk to Brian Eno. OK. He's a composer. Fantastic. So you got a job to do. Uh, talk to Brian Eno. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll see if he talks to me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. A round of applause for you. Thank you. Uh,